Good morning, and welcome delegates to today's concurrent session, The Undeniable Need for Broadband Connectivity in a Pandemic and Post-Pandemic World. The session is kindly sponsored today by the Canadian Association of Wireless Internet Service Providers, or CANWISP, who is also represented on our panel today. So thank you. My name is Amber Crawford, and I'm a policy advisor with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, and I will be your moderator for this session. I am pleased to be joined today by three panelists who will speak to the opportunities and challenges that COVID-19 has highlighted around broadband and wireless connectivity in Ontario, as well as what Council should consider when looking to improve connectivity in their communities. At the outset, it is important to be clear that AMO is technology agnostic in our advocacy. We are focused on how policies around connectivity can ensure equal access for all Ontarians, rather than on the specifics of what it would take technology-wise. As you will hear today, one size certainly does not fit all. We will begin our session by hearing some set remarks from each of our panelists, and then we'll open the line up for discussion and live Q&A. Delegates, you may ask your questions in writing using the chat function of Zoom. Please kindly provide your name and municipality up front, and if you wish, indicate who the question is for. We will do our best to get to all of them, but questions if we don't will be answered offline after the session today. So our first panelist today is Aaron Britnell, Manager of Information Technology for the Town of Caledon, who will speak about the town's experience with their broadband. In addition to her job in the IT department, she recognizes the importance of taking a systems-wide and corporate perspective at what opportunities can be leveraged if all departments can work on being in the connectivity business. After Erin, Terry Yancey will speak from the region of Waterloo. Terry is the Director of Information Techn Technology Services for the region and has been with the region for nine years. Along with Erin, Terry has become a fantastic asset to AMO as an expert on explaining the different solutions that already exist for communities looking to get or improve their connectivity and what key messages Council should know when discussing a path forward. And last but not least, we will hear from Jonathan Black, who is the Executive Director of CANWISP, the Canadian Association of Wireless Internet Service Providers. This is the first time that they've joined us at AMO, and I will let Jonathan provide you with background um, of their role and the role that fixed wireless internet service providers have in playing to provide access to households and businesses, nationally in their case, but also in Ontario, for our purposes. I think the members will find it encouraging to hear the interesting solutions that exist right now for communities, especially those that are not going to see the 5G solution come their way as soon as others by nature of their density or location. So with that, I will thank each of the panelists for being here today and I will pass it over to Erin to begin. Okay, well, thank you, Amber, for that introduction. And I'm really excited to be here today to uh, share a little bit about what Kaladin has learned to, so far. Uh, it's still a work in progress. We're still learning lots of things, but I, uh, I'm hoping that you'll be able to have some good takeaways from, from what we've done so far. So just to get you started, if you haven't heard of Caledon, so Caledon has a population of just over 70,000 people. Uh, we're part of the region of Peel, but interestingly enough, it's less than 10% of the population, but both Mississauga and Brampton could fit into the geography of Caledon. So it's a very large area. And as you can see from all the green area, it's very rural in nature. So that bottom part is where all of our growth is happening, uh, except for some of the infill in the brown. The rest is rural areas. Most of it is farmland and hamlets that are far apart, which is where we get our broadband challenge. 61% of our roads do not have access to proper broadband. And we really saw this with COVID as we're not that far from the GTA. So we have a lot of residents who normally would be traveling into the GTA to work and into the city. And instead they're at home and they're really struggling with their internet access. Can you imagine being on the top of a hill in Caledon, being able to see the CN Tower, but not actually call the person or FaceTime with the person sitting at the bottom of the tower? So to get an idea of what we had to do about this problem, uh, we really had to look at what our options are. So we know municipalities, we don't own the responsibility for this problem. However, our residents expect us to support them in finding access. So we needed to investigate a range of options. And for every municipality, how we use these options and what options that are available to us are unique. And for Caledon, we're relatively small, our budgets are relatively small. So I'm going to kind of focus on what we were able to choose from in this spectrum. And that's to advocate and to incentivize. The other ones were really out of our scope because simply we can't afford to do some of these town built, town operated ones. The risk is from a financial perspective is too big. 
and we weren't sure that there would be a provider who would be willing to work with us on some of these options. And of course, the market wasn't operating on its own, so that was out. So that left us with our other two options. So I kind of wanted to highlight here is our 40 to $60 million gap to fill all the rest of our roads and to provide access. And I'm gonna go into each of these options that we've pursued and give you a little bit more detail. Because I know that's the part that I think is most useful is what did we do and how could you do something similar in your community? So of course, the first thing that we have to do is we have to define what the problem is. So as you can see, in 2016, we did our first mapping exercise. We actually hired a consultant to go out and try to figure out where all of our gap areas were. Well, this was really helpful at first, but what it did is it created a moment in time. So what we weren't getting was an update of what has changed as things go on. And as we know, in the broadband industry, things do change over time, whether it's getting worse or getting better. So what instead we've now done is we're working with Sierra to create a more dynamic map that actually changes as people test their internet. So as you can see in our 2020 version, we have areas that have some stronger, stronger internet, and those are a lot of our more urban areas. And then we have a lot of that red area, and those are our areas we need coverage. And this is actually coming from our residents and their experience. And we're actually working to publish this information in a more of a, a heat map type format on our website. So now that we knew what the problem was, we had to figure out how do we solve it? And the first thing that council did was that in 2016, they created something called a broadband levy. And this broadband levy actually generates about $300,000 per year dedicated to broadband solutions in Caledon. Now, what does this mean for the average resident? It's about 10 to $20 per household, depending on obviously the value of their home. And the biggest thing that you need to do this is just the will of council. We know that residents do not like more taxation and more pieces to this. However, we know that it's very beneficial if we can put some money towards a problem and, and pool our resources. So with council's uh, endorsement and, and council's uh, moving this forward, what we were able to do is each year we take our $300,000 and invest in a number of, of solutions. So we also know that we're not alone in this problem. And for a small municipality in particular, one of the things we can do is create economies of scale by joining with our fellow municipalities around us. So for Caledon, this meant joining SWIFT in 2016. Now SWIFT is the Southwestern Internet uh, Collaborative, similar to what EORN is in Eastern Ontario, if, if you're familiar with that. And what this is, is we signed an agreement to work with partners to actually go out and try to get grants to establish funding with the province, with the federal government, and operate uh, through an RFP process that we can uh, attract funding for. Now for Caledon, we were just released our funding of just over $5 million. What Caledon put in to get that was about 634,000 and change. And what this means is at least an 8.3 return on our investment. So the next piece I want to talk about, I think will be really important for those elected officials in the room. Well, that is how do we advocate to other levels of government? We know that both the federal and the provincial government also have a large stake to play in this discussion. The important ways of which you can advocate is to be consistent, to be clear, and to make sure you have a strong business case supported. So for us in Caledon, we've done things like met with our local MPs, MPPs. We have currently a council motions that were passed from council to say we need to make this an essential service. We work through AMO and through Roma to meet and meet with ministers to try to explain our challenges. We also have a petition that's currently live to go to our local MP and MPP. And the important part is, is that we're consistent and making sure the message is heard over and over until we can get change. So one of the other things we did was we took some of that money that we had left uh, from our SWIFT money and from the broadband levy and we said, well, we have about $250,000, who wants to help us out? So we went through a public procurement process and we did this because we wanted to find out what was the best deal out there for our residents and how could we find the best partner for us? Through this, we actually awarded a contract in 2019 to to Vionet. And through that, we built 8.2 kilometers in our industrial area, which connected a lot of our small business community. 
And then we built also coming soon a 35 kilometer uh, backbone through the Caledon Trailway. What we did was we basically took $250,000 and we turned this into $2 million in infrastructure. This shows you what you can do when you have partnerships and just having a little bit of stake in the ground and what this can mean to the success in your community. We know this will only solve a small part of the problem, but it is progress. And the important things that you need to do is that you need to work with procurement staff to make sure we're doing this in an open and transparent manner and making sure you understand where your underserved areas are so that the funding can be targeted to those areas. So the last thing I have here I wanted to talk about was our development standards. So when you have new development happening in your community, and Caledon's fortunate that especially in our southern areas, we have some new development. And they have to follow a certain development standards when they come forward with their proposals. Well, what does this mean? Well, this means that you can include fiber as a provision that has to be installed as part of the utility portion. This means for in Caledon that instead of having to go back and hook up these new communities, we can actually make sure there's fiber there from the beginning. Yes, this only accounts for new development areas, but again, it's using what tools are your, available at your disposal, and it actually involves a lot uh, less staff time than you'd think to actually move this forward. We've also done some interim projects to help just hook people up in the interim until we can get the actual connections to their homes. And this includes free Wi-Fi at our town facilities. And during COVID, we actually expanded this to include our parking lots because we wanted to make sure staff had access, as well as the residents who needed access to our fiber, even though that the, the town facilities were closed. We also created a hotspot lending program with our library where you can borrow a hotspot to use temporarily, say you had a meeting happening at home. And this has become a very popular program. We're currently working with our roads team to look for partners to install conduit in the roads when we are doing construction to make this uh, an easier way for companies to get into the roads um, when they're already being torn up by the town. And we're always looking for more options. I think that's the most important thing for us is that we're keeping our minds open to what's possible in the industry and we know the industry changes. Lastly, I really just wanted to talk about what did we learn from all of this? Well, the most important thing is, well, we learn from others, but then we actually adopted it to our local context. Caledon's full of hills, so sometimes towers work in some areas and they don't work in others, but we wanted to make sure that we adapted it to what works best for Caledon. Secondly, we had to be creative and open to new solutions. We tried things with our RFP, even though there wasn't really an example in the market for us to model after, because we needed to try something and see if we could have some success. We also made sure it was a corporate problem and not an IT problem. We looked at things like development standards. We looked at things like what we can do with our roads. And by everyone looking into their own portfolios and how they could help, it really helped us move this along. And as I said, with development standards, use the tools you have at your disposal. Municipalities do have things that we can use to help spur our providers to come and work in our communities. And lastly, which I think is most important from, for the political audience is champion it. I think for you being the champions, we've been very fortunate in Caledon to have a very strong council who have really made this a priority for them, which is from a staff perspective, made it easier to continue to move things forward as they're supportive of staff of looking at different options. And that's it for me. So thank you very much for uh, listening to what we have going on in Caledon. As I said, we're always looking to learn new options from what you're doing in your communities as well. And I uh, look forward to having any questions from you. And I will uh, pass it back over to Terry to talk about what's happening in some of the bigger communities. Okay, thank you, Aaron, for those remarks. I will now introduce Terry. Thanks, Amber, and uh, thanks everyone for, for sitting in today. My name is Terry Yancey. I'm the Director of Information Technology Services at the Region of Waterloo. And I, like Aaron, uh, want to present some of our municipal challenges and opportunities. In fact, some of our history with broadband, things that we've done in the region and things we're hoping to do. Um, I think what you'll quickly come to realize is very similar to Aaron. Uh, we have a lot of the same challenges. The region has been very fortunate in the last few years. We've been ranked as one of the fastest growing communities. Uh, we're looking to increase by almost a quarter of a million people in the next 20 years. 
And we've just come off of a very successful, a little over a year ago in June, um, $3.2 billion have been invested along our new ION LRT, our light rail transit system, which launched uh, last summer. So when you look at our map, the townships, the four townships of uh, Woolwich, Wellesley, Wilmot, and North Dumfries surround three urban cities in the core of Waterloo Region. Um, if you take a different look from a rural perspective, what you'll discover is, again, much like Aaron, we have a population of about 70,000 in these rural townships. They've been seeing significant growth along with the region. But what the residents have realized is they're underserved in terms of broadband, which is a serious negative impact on both the residents and the businesses in these areas. We'll talk a little bit more in later, but SWIFT is one of our, like Caledon, one of our approaches to uh, deal with this issue, but it's not the only solution. And uh, it's a very big problem and there's a many faceted approach. That's one of the things I wanna talk about. So a little bit more in the region, we have this unique mix of urban and rural very technology centric. Uh, we have two universities, two major universities in Waterloo and Wilfrid Laurier and Conestoga College as well. Uh, proximity to the GRTTA is very good by a continually improving GO Transit service as well the 401 cuts through the very middle of the region of Waterloo. Um, the other part that is unique is the nature of our technology sector. So open text, is in the region of Waterloo. Google here, desire to learn, 11X, who I'll talk about a little bit more, and MyoVision, two examples of technology companies we've engaged with that both have a connectivity requirement, not necessarily broadband, but it's an example of the variety of types of connectivity we're dealing with here in the region. So if you take a minute and reflect back, this article's from April 30th, uh, which seems like a very long time ago now, but this was open text announcement on April 30th, about five, six weeks into the pandemic, that they made an announcement very early on that 95% of their employees uh, had been working from home. They'd seen amazingly productive employees as a result, and they made an early decision to actually close half of its physical offices around the world. Uh, their headquarters in Waterloo is still open. They're still working from home as of today as a result of the pandemic. But one of the things the article doesn't mention in the amazing productivity is that many of these residents who came to the region to work for open text liked the rural nature of parts of the region. But what they didn't like was the issues that arose when they had to try and work from home with an underserved broadband in their in their area you know the almost exact same announcement came from google a couple of weeks later that they'd left their office nine weeks ago from the time this article was written in may 2020 with no expectation that we'll be back in an office setting resembling anything like what we were on before march 12th with any date at all so that was the general manager of Google Canada. And again, as far as I know, that still remains the case. So those that were in urban areas that were well served are working from home and again, being productive. Those that return to their homes in rural areas are having that same challenge. So that's one example in a COVID and post COVID world that's highlighted the need for rural broadband. And there's many more. Next slide, I want to talk a little bit about same spectrum of options that Aaron talked about. So like any good municipal employee, I directly copied Aaron's content in terms of what spectrum of options are available to us. And in the regional context, you know, the first one, let the market operate on their own, has been successful, but only in, a urban con in an urban context. Um, as Aaron pointed out, the urban areas are reasonably served by the market. It's the rural areas where the challenge is. The region's taken some advocacy efforts uh, through organizations like AMO and Marco, and we're hoping that those efforts yield results in terms of future investments. Uh, incentives for ISPs, again, like Caledon, the region is a partner in SWIFT, a funding partner. Our, RF, our RFPs are also uh, on the street right now. We're looking forward to those. We'll talk about SWIFT more later. And in the last two options, the municipally built and ISP operated, the region's very fortunate to be a member of RepNet, which is a much sector wide area network 
that I'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes, the challenge with that is it doesn't necessarily address um, private residences and businesses in the rural areas where it has been successful for regional and mush sector services in the rural areas. And finally, municipally owned broadband, not an option that's been explored in the region, but as a former Stratford resident, and any of you that know the situation in Stratford with Rhizome Networks and the work done by uh, Mayor Dan Matheson, I think there's good examples there of how the municipality themselves can get engaged and actually start to provide broadband. So I uh, just want to do an overview. What I hope you take away from this is some of the key elements of my presentation in terms of gathering requirements is key for any type of analysis like this. Uh, Aaron talked about that in terms of where the gaps are. There's a big opportunity here to learn about technology. Uh, coming from IT, we're very acronym centric and we want to make sure that we don't bog down in that. But I think it's incumbent upon all decision makers to learn more about the options. Uh, simplifying the processes involved in helping broadband implementations is key. Uh, matching all of the solutions to the requirements. At the end of the day, it's about applications and information sharing. Each of them might have a different requirement can be met through a different technology. So the technologies we learned about in the second key can be applied differently. Clearly, there's an investment component. We can talk about that. And SWIFT is the example we're using at the region. And then share and partner everywhere on everything we might want to attempt. So I'm just going to dive into a couple of examples here and a little bit more clarity that, you know, in our requirements gathering, a traditional approach to requirements gathering in IT, understand your needs. Um, different applications that use broadband. What we've learned at the region is that the uses of connected devices, users and sites is almost unlimited. The market will come up with solutions. The key element that they all need is some kind of connectivity. There's, there's very little um, standalone technology anymore. If it's not connected to the internet or to a network somehow, it's not the kind of technology solution that providers are offering. Aaron did a great job of coverage mapping. Something that's key, uh, CIRA is a great resource to know where the gaps are, uh, and it helps prioritize investment approaches. I think one of the other things it goes without saying, especially from an IT perspective, is that understand your security and privacy requirements in any application that you hope will implement and make sure that uh, they're included in any solutions right down to the provider level. And I think the overarching point here is that this is not just a technology problem. Although as technicians, we can do a good job of helping explain options and helping define terms, um, it's going to take a, a cross-functional effort between planning, economic development, financials, and funding, basically everyone in the region to understand what those requirements are and come up with solutions that meet the needs. I mentioned learning, so I threw all my favorite acronyms on here. I don't expect you to understand or in fact know them all, but I think one of the challenges is as we go through this that these are terms that will become very common, I think, in everyday uh, language. I think Wi-Fi is one that everyone understands, local um, wireless networks. 5G, there's a lot of talk about 5G, and I think as uh, Amber noted in the introduction, it's not, it's talked about like it's in the, f in the near future, it's actually not, especially for rural areas. LTE in terms of cellular connectivity, again, uh, very important but not always available, especially in rural areas. Point, I refer to point-to-point -point wireless. Jonathan will talk more about wireless internet service providers, but the technology, the core technology is the same. And then I even want to use examples of far lesser known technologies like LoRaWAN, LoRa, LoRa standing for long range. It's not a broadband technology, but it's a very important internet of things technology. I'll give you an example of how we require it at the region. And then other terms like latency and capacity, although they may not be natural today, I think there's analogies that uh, we can use to help explain those. And again, that's where I think municipal IT departments are a great resource, especially when it comes to learning. But we're again, as I mentioned, we're only one part of the solution. One that I'm not an expert in here is the internal processes, the planning and the construction uh, processes, the idea of dig once. Uh, Aaron again did a good job of mentioning that. 
And I know for a fact that approval and consent processes, in fact, we at the region sometimes are our own worst enemy in making sure we approve the projects we need to do our own operations. So it's really important to consider these internal processes and what impact, if any, they're having on broadband expansion so that when carriers finally do decide to make investments, have we made it as simple for them as possible? And have we made it that we're the kind of municipality they want to come and work in because their projects become more streamlined and easier to work on. So any process simplification we can do will only benefit the efforts we put in. Uh, match your solutions to the requirements. Again, without getting into it, um, the broadband requirements are really diverse. It's not a one size fits all. Uh, we have to match the technology to the uh, examples. And again, we'll look at some examples later. Uh, I'm not gonna do a SWIFT presentation other than to say the region like Helen is a member of SWIFT. It's not a 100% solution. Uh, our RFPs are on the street. We hope to see construction in 2021, but it's a good first step in meeting some of the greater needs. And sharing and partnering. Partner with everyone. Hydros, carriers, tech companies, other municipalities, education, health sector. I think everyone needs the same connectivity, so when you can share it, it's far more effective and cost effective. Start small with new technologies and pilot things, and when opportunities present themselves, go big. I'll give you an example of that. And that's RepNet. RepNet is a 20 year old project using dark fiber technology where we've connected all, and I'll start with this, what it is where we connected all of the mush sector facilities in the region of Waterloo over the last 20 years. About 380 sites now are connected. It's a great network to provide remote access to central resources. So a school board headquarters. And in fact, the school boards in the region of Waterloo were one of the first to achieve a one gig per school uh, network capacity. And it's, it's been a very tremendous benefit. It's not a public solution. It's not for all, uh, it's, it's a public sector solution. It's not for private sector bandwidth. And I wanna make sure that's clear. But what it can be is a backbone and potentially sharing our network to do other things. So I think the example that Aaron gave, we did the same way. We were providing Wi-Fi in our rural libraries where we could help the um, public get access to Wi-Fi during COVID. Our rural libraries aren't all connected to uh, RepNet because it's, it's still not effective for all rural areas, but it's still better than what many of them have and what many of the residents had, which was very little. So. It uh, can be a backbone for other wireless technologies as well. And we use it for our own point-to-point -point wireless. And Jonathan will talk about the nature of that technology later. The other case study here, and again, I've made references to all of them. You can follow up after or ask questions in the, in, the, in the session after. But, you know, a long-range wireless like LoRaWAN for devices. So it's low bandwidth, low energy consumption. In the region's case, we've done a pilot where we're collecting real-time information off our regional um, test wells and production wells in our aquifer. It's been a pretty exciting project and it's not necessarily a, band, a broadband project, but it's important to recognize it as an example of technology matched with solution. And the third one is a MileVision. MileVision is a local tech company that does advanced traffic management systems. We're planning to connect over 270 regional intersections via cellular. Again, the right connectivity technology for the right solution. The advantage is we could use it for other applications, perhaps transit applications, smart street lighting applications. And again, as long as there's cellular coverage in rural areas, it can be adapted to, the, to that location as well. So in summary, as I said, gathering your requirements is key. Doing some learning about technologies is a great option and IT in your, your um, municipalities is a good resource. Process simplification is always good, removal of red tape, Matching this solution to the requirements you've gathered, continuing to invest as you've been already doing, and then share in partnership. Uh, that's my presentation. I appreciate your time and attention. I look forward to answering more questions in the upcoming uh, panel session that follows. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, for those remarks. I will now introduce Jonathan. And I'm recording, and just give it a couple seconds once I mute, and I'm muting my mic now. Sure. 
Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. I realize this is the third day of the conference and we're getting near the end of the sessions and they put me third on the agenda. Um, I'm actually going to use the word physics and we're going to talk about some technology. So uh, I hope I can make it interesting enough for you to uh, hang in there through to the end. But uh, I'm looking forward to the Q&A. We'll see what comes out there. Very quickly, we're going to run through definition of uh, what a WISP is and a little bit about CanWISP and the Canadian and Ontario industries. As well, we'll talk about 5G and spectrum auctions and then some things that uh, impact the municipalities in Ontario. First of all, if you're not familiar with a WISP, a WISP is a wireless internet service provider. It's fixed wireless, it's not mobile, it's not your cell phone. The infrastructure, typically it's a uh, small and medium business. Uh, they connect uh, businesses and uh, individuals in typically in rural uh, or ex-urban areas and a lot of these companies started uh, because they didn't have internet in their area so someone who had a technology background went out bought the equipment figured out how to do this typically 10-15 years ago and they brought internet to their homes then their neighbors found out and their neighbors and, and soon enough they had a company and they were running their own little ISP in a rural area of uh, Ontario and Canada. They do build their own networks. They don't rely on uh, third party networks for resale. Uh, they do use the major carriers to backhaul their internet service back to uh, the cloud, but typically it's their own network. They live in your neighborhoods, in your areas, and, and they know your, your uh, regions very well. This is a, a very quick graph in the middle there in the top, you'll see the WISP and the tiny office will typically go out through a fiber connection to a tower. On this map, you'll see the red uh, fuzzy lines or the red uh, radio signals. They're wireless connections from tower to tower. And then there's distribution points out from each tower into a customer or business's home uh, for the uh, end user to use uh, the internet. Um, now the tower, uh, the, the transmitter location, that can be a communications tower like you're used to seeing, or it could be a farmer's silo, it could be a building, any tall structure uh, does as long as it's stable and sturdy. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, interesting parts of municipal consent for that a little later in the presentation. CanWISP is an organization who we represent uh, WISPs across the country uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, well, seven years ago, a group of 12 WISPs met in Ottawa to begin to promote their industry and to represent themselves to the CRTC and to ISED. One of the challenges when you're a small and medium business, you don't have a team of lawyers to talk with uh, the government. And when we got started actually and started having meetings with ISED and the CRTC, we said, hey, we represent the small uh, ISPs in the country. And they said, yeah, yeah, like Kojiko and Shaw, we know, we know the small guys. No, we said you need to think about GoZoom and you need to think about core broadband. There's eight employees in the company or less. Uh, so really we focused on three major areas. We represent those smaller players in issues around spectrum, access to spectrum for the small players, uh, regulations, regulations that are right sized for those companies and as well funding. A number of the funding programs years ago implicitly excluded the smaller players. Uh, because of some of the financial or reporting requirements that were put in place. Canvas ha has about 55 members and uh, in Ontario specifically, there are about 35 members of Canvas, but about one third of WISPs. So there's about 70 WISPs in Ontario. There's 250 across the country. They're locally owned and operated, private, often family owned. And they, as I mentioned before, they're serving communities not served by the national carriers or the incumbents. Many of these uh, fixed wireless uh, companies are also now installing their own fiber to the home. So that's an interesting development when you think about working with or uh, partnering with them. And again, we'll mention that in a little bit. Um, this is a bit of history now. We're, we'll move a little bit towards 5G. Uh, this is a chart, uh, shows you the download speeds. And again, they, they vary because the technologies do vary based on uh, what service level is provided. And to try and put that in perspective, I've, I've put there sort of a two hour HD movie and how many minutes it would take to download that movie and the various technologies. And I actually have dial up up there. Dial up still exists. Um, it is still in use in Ontario. Um, 
It's often in uh, rural areas or in, in situations where there's a fixed income or lower income. It, sometimes it's the only option available to those uh, people for those two reasons. 5G, again, we'll talk about that. It's a typically a mobile wireless technology. It's very fast and it's very quick. Fiber, uh, fiber delivers some of the best service available. And again, you can see it takes less than a minute to uh, download uh, your favorite Netflix movie in, in HD. So what is 5G technology? It's a collection of technology advances. I've put some names up there. There is no test on this. Many of these advances are also being deployed in other types of networks now in fixed wireless uh, networks, for example. Uh, 5G technology uses two spectrum bands to achieve these incredible results. It uses a very high band and a low band. High band, uh, meaning very small millimeter wave frequencies and low band, meaning sub six gigahertz frequencies. The other aspect of 5G technology is it requires very highly fiber connected equipment. In, in each location, typically, there needs to be a fiber connection to deliver the type of service that 5G is promising. Now, this is where I mentioned physics, so hang in there. Talked about the frequencies, the higher number, those millimeter wave frequencies, it carries an awful lot of data very fast. The lower number or the low band frequencies, they, that data or the data that's carried in those frequencies is a little slower, but only a little. The connection is much more reliable. It goes through trees, it can go through walls, and it can also carry data further. If you want to think about it, um, one of these is, is quick and one of these is fast. And uh, if your car buffs, you'll understand the difference there. But 5G uses both of those frequencies to deliver the outstanding performance that it does. Now, there are some implications to this. In order to use those higher frequencies, the access points or the equipment need to be very close together. Think 500 meters. Now, if you're connecting a fiber to each piece of equipment that's 500 meters apart, some of you who have rural areas, how many fiber connections do you need between each home? You're going to need multiple fiber connections in between your homes. Uh, that's a very expensive proposition, a very long install period. And frankly, the truth is, 5G in its fullest, most uh, dynamic implementation probably isn't going to be coming to your rural area anytime soon. Now, what does, what does 5G mean? 5G is about self-driving cars, cloud gaming, virtual reality, some very exciting stuff. 5G is about the urban. I visited a couple of uh, carrier websites and they mentioned Calgary, Vancouver, Edmonton, Montreal, the GTA. They did not mention uh, Ottawa, much to my chagrin, and they did not mention Kitchener-Waterloo. So some highly uh, techno technologically savvy areas are going to be missed in the initial rollouts of 5G. I don't know that there's any plans to take 5G beyond those urban centers across the country. 5G is not about coverage for the unserved. 5G is about faster internet for those who have it already. It's about some incredibly fascinating uh, dynamic applications that will be coming, but it isn't going to help your rural or underserved areas. Now, heading into spectrum a bit, there, there is a tie here. You'll see it in a couple of minutes. Spectrum is a natural resource. Really, it should be used for the benefit of all Canadians and not just sold to the highest bidder. There are a few types of spectrum. Spectrum has been reserved as unlicensed or shared, lightly licensed or fully licensed. Fully licensed spectrum is purchased by an auction for the exclusive use of that owner within a geographic zone called a tier. Now licensed spectrum is the most expensive and it's typically the uh, best way to deliver a reliable wireless signal. Now it's typically also owned by the majors and it does, it has been used to deploy mobile services in the most densely populated uh, urban areas. WISPs, on the other hand, being small and medium enterprises, they've been using unlicensed spectrum and they do deliver uh, service to Canadians, rural Canadians, uh, quite reliably across the country, even with this unlicensed spectrum. Now, there's a spectrum auction coming up next year. They're the, uh, the frequency in the 3.5 gigahertz band, that's in that lower band that we talked about, is being uh, auctioned off. 
Uh, we're excited that ISTED has actually implemented a set aside. They're reserving some spectrum for smaller players to bid on. Now, the smaller players are probably going to be the Kojikos and Shaws, the Videotrons. It is not likely to be a majority of the uh, WISPs across the country. Some will participate. Uh, we had also asked ISTED to consider uh, even smaller geographic tiers that would allow the smallest WISPs to bid on spectrum. Um, but we'll see how the auction goes. We are uh, glad that it's being, that there is the set aside and we do expect some WISPs will, will participate in the auction. Now, what are the municipal implications for all of this? Uh, certainly, there have been a number of recently announced funding programs and the three and a half gigahertz thought spectrum auction that's coming should lead to more broadband in rural Ontario. What can you do as municipalities to prepare? So uh, Aaron talked about mapping uh, the internet service in your area or mapping the gap. Uh, strongly recommend send your residents to an internet performance test. This is an ISTED CIRA joint venture. The link is there, you won't write it down, but it is in the presentation. That is uh, the tool that Aaron was using to help map in real time the uh, um, service provided to the community. There are also some things Terry uh, mentioned, uh, some of the um, processes for getting approvals, um, specifically, you know, to some of your municipal infrastructure to uh, access to your buildings, access to, you may even own communications towers. If you can make that simple, when you find a partner to work with, um, it will be much easier for them to roll out um, internet quicker. Now, there are more spectrum auctions coming up. We will continue to talk to ISED about delivering uh, smaller uh, geographic sections that will help in those rural areas, uh, possibly excluding the urban areas from the the geographic tiers. This should help again with uh, smaller players getting access to Spectrum. The other thing I want to emphasize is consider using a local WISP as a partner in any broadband effort you're undertaking. Uh, they can connect, they already connect underserved people. They're used to it. They love that. They already know your area and they can move very quickly. Um, maybe if you're taking on an ICON project, maybe consider partnering with one of them. If you're not aware of any in your area, um, my contact information is at the end. I'd be happy to connect you with a, a WISP in your area uh, to uh, investigate them as a potential partner in a project you might be undertaking. So thank you for hanging in there for the whole presentation. I hope it was interesting and uh, sorry I had to use the word physics, but uh, I think it hung together there fairly well. Looking forward to your questions uh, in the Q&A session this upcoming and uh, happy to answer any questions after the event as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for your presentation and, of course, to all the panelists for their presentations. We are now going to move into the live Q&A portion of the session.